Section 42 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by HearHis.com. The British Matron by Nathaniel Hawthorne. I have heard a good deal of the tenacity with which English ladies retain their personal beauty to a late period of life, but not to suggest that an American eye needs use and cultivation before it can quite appreciate the charm of English beauty at any age, it strikes me that an English lady of fifty is apt to become a creature less refined and delicate, so far as her physique goes, than anything that we Western people class under the name of woman. She has an awful ponderosity of frame, not pulpy, like the looser development of our few fat women, but massive, with solid beef and streaky tallow, so that, though struggling manfully against the idea, you inevitably think of her as made up of steaks and sirloins. When she walks, her advance is elephantine. When she sits down, it is on a great round space of her maker's footstool, where she looks as if nothing could ever move her. She imposes awe and respect by the muchness of her personality, to such a degree that you would probably credit her with far greater moral and intellectual force than she can fairly claim. Her visage is unusually grim and stern, seldom positively forbidding, yet calmly terrible, not merely by its breadth and weight of feature, but because it seems to express so much well-defined self-reliance. Such acquaintance with the world, its toils, troubles, and dangers, and such sturdy capacity for trampling down a foe, without anything positively salient, or actively offensive, or indeed unjustly formidable to her neighbors, she has the effect of a seventy-four-gun ship in time of peace, for while you assure yourself that there is no real danger, you cannot help thinking how tremendous would be her onset if pugnaciously inclined, and how futile the effort to inflict any counter-injury. She certainly looks tenfold, nay, a hundredfold better able to take care of herself than our slender-framed and haggard womankind. But I have not found reason to suppose that the English dowager of fifty has actually greater courage, fortitude, and strength of character than our women of similar age, or even a tougher physical endurance than they. Morally, she is strong, I suspect, only in society and in the common routine of social affairs, and would be found powerless and timid in any exceptionally strait that might call for energy outside of the conventionalities amid which she has grown up. You can meet this figure in the street, and live, and even smile at the recollection, but conceive of her in a ballroom with the bare brawny arms that she invariably displays there, and all the other corresponding development, such as is beautiful in the maiden blossom, but a spectacle to howl at in such an overblown cabbage rose as this. Yet somewhere in this enormous bulk there must be hidden the modest, slender, violet nature of a girl whom an alien mass of earthliness has unkindly overgrown, for an English maiden in her teens, though very seldom so pretty as our own damsels, possesses, to say the truth, a certain charm of half-blossom, and delicately folded leaves, and tender womanhood shielded by maidenly reserves, with which, somehow or the other, our American girls often fail to adorn themselves during an appreciable moment. It is a pity that the English violets should 
grow into such an outrageously developed peony as I have attempted to describe. I wonder whether a middle-aged husband ought to be considered as legally married to all the accretions that have overgrown the slenderness of his bride since he led her to the altar, and which make her so much more than he ever bargained for. It is not a sounder view of the case that the matrimonial bond cannot be held to include the three-fourths of the wife that had no existence when the ceremony was performed, and, as a matter of conscience and good morals, ought not an English married pair to insist upon the celebration of a silver wedding at the end of twenty-five years, in order to legalize and mutually appropriate that corporeal growth of which both parties have individually come into possession since they were pronounced one flesh end of section forty two recorded by herehis.com